Today we're going to talk about what is probably the most important rule for derivatives in Calc 1. It's called the chain rule. And so we're going to start off just by a little basic exploration here. We're going to write y equals 8x squared minus 4 as a composite of two functions. So we're going to write one of them as y equals 4u. And if y equals 4u, then u must equal 2x squared minus 1. That's because then 4 times 2x squared minus 1 would give us 8x squared minus 4. And all we're going to do is we're going to figure out what dy dx is, what dy du is, and what du dx is. So first off, dy dx is just the derivative of y with respect to x. So the derivative of 8x squared is just 16x, and the derivative of minus 4 is 0. So dy dx is 16x. Okay. dy du is the derivative of y with respect to u, where we treat the variable as u instead of something else like x. So the derivative of 4u with respect to u is just 4. And the derivative of u with respect to x, du dx, is just the derivative of 2x squared minus 1, which is 4x. And with any luck, we would see that we have a relationship here between these three terms that we got, where 16x is equal to 4 times 4x, or that dy dx is equal to dy du times du dx, as long as we've written our original y, which was in terms of x, as a composite of two functions, y equals f of u and u of x is over here. And so this little rule we've got down here is actually the chain rule. Now, we haven't actually proved this rule. We've just seen that the application of it works with this one particular function. But what we're going to do is we're going to actually write out, um, we're going to write out a composition of functions like we normally would as f of g of x. And we're going to see if we can figure out how to take the derivative of this thing. Well, the derivative of a composition of functions, f of g of x, isn't a rule that we've got other than the chain rule that we're trying to prove. So we have to write it out as a limit as h approaches 0 of the function evaluated at x plus h, so that would be f of g of x plus h minus f of g of x, all divided by h. And we're actually going to use a full cool little trick here that we've used with some of our other derivatives. And that is, we're going to just multiply by a specific term into the top and the bottom of this. And it's not expected for you to remember this exact term um, or to even see a good way to come up with it, but it's kind of ingenious what's going to happen here. We're going to multiply by g of x plus h minus g of x on the top. And we're going to multiply by the same thing on the bottom, because if I do it to the top, I've got to do it to the bottom as well. So now we've got this new limit, the limit of h approaches 0, of f of g of x plus h minus f of g of x over h times g of x plus h minus g of x over g of x plus h minus g of x. And with any luck, as we sit here looking at this, we might recognize that if I could just flip this denominator and this denominator, if I could just swap those around, the fraction on the right would read as g of x plus h minus g of x over h. And I'd be taking a limit as h approaches 0 of that. And g of x plus h minus g of x over h is a difference quotient. And so if I take the limit as h approaches 0 of the difference quotient, I just get a derivative. So let's swap those and write this as two separate limits. One, the limit as h approaches 0 of f of g of x plus h minus f of g of x over g 
of x plus h minus g of x. And then we'll take that limit and we'll multiply it by the limit as h approaches zero of g of x plus h minus g of x, now just over h. And um, on the right-hand side here, as we were saying before, this is just a limit as h approaches zero of a different quotient for g of x. So that must equal g prime of x. So this whole thing is g prime of x. And we're going to have to do a little bit of a manipulation with this left-hand side to simplify it down. There's another cool little substitution that we're going to do. Um, we pick a variable that we want to use. I don't know. Let's, um, let's use w here. So let's let w equal g of x plus h minus g of x, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to turn that denominator then into just a w. And when we do a substitution within a limit, we have to take into account the fact that h was approaching zero. That doesn't necessarily mean that w is approaching zero. So let's think about what happens as h approaches zero. If h approaches zero, what does w approach? Well, if I put in zero for h here, I just end up with g of x minus g of x, which is zero. So as h approaches zero, w approaches zero. And another thing that we might want to note here, and in fact, we definitely do want to note it, is that the value of g of x plus h is also equal to g of x plus w, right? If I take this and solve for g of x plus h, it gives me g of x plus w. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this substitution down here, all this stuff we've written here, into this, and we're just going to replace the second limit with g prime of x. So what that's going to give us is a limit as w approaches zero of f of, and we had f of g of x plus h. Um, but so now this, if we look back, right, we had, we had f of g of x plus h. Well, g of x plus h is just equal to g of x plus w. So we're going to change that into f of g of x plus w. And then we still had a minus f of g of x out there. So we'll, we'll keep that there. Right? That's, uh, that's what we already had here, f of g of x. So we'll keep that. And then on the bottom, the g of x plus h minus the g of x, well, we said that's equal to w. So this is now just going to be over w. And then at the end here, we have our second limit from before, which just became g prime of x, right? We had the limit as h approaches zero of g of x plus h minus g of x all over h, that's g prime. So now we're actually done here other than writing out this last step. If we look at that limit that's still up there, we should see that this is just a difference quotient where the x value that we're looking at is actually g of x, and the h that we would normally see in there is actually w. Right? If I reread this as every w is replaced with an h and every x, or sorry, every g of x is replaced with an x, I would have a limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. That's just a derivative of f at x. Well, since this isn't actually true, we're just using this as a tool to kind of help us sort of see what's going on here. This is just a derivative of f evaluated at g of x. So this becomes f prime of g of x times g prime of x over here. And this is the other notation for the chain rule. 
And so we're going to want to remember both of these notations that we kind of explored in the last few minutes, that the derivative of f of g of x is f prime of g of x times g prime of x, and that dy dx is dy du times du dx if we can write them as a composition of two functions. Okay? And so this is going to allow us to take the derivative of things like the sine of 12x or cosine squared of x, where there's a function within another function. Um, and one way we kind of might want to start thinking about this in our head is thinking about it as if we think about the composition of the functions f of g, it's the derivative of the outer function f evaluated at the inner function g times the derivative of the inner function. And if you think about it that way, the derivative of the outer function evaluated at the inner function times the derivative of the inner function, it's going to help you as we move through here to be able to do some of these more difficult derivatives in your head. And that's really going to be our goal is to be able to do the chain rule for derivatives in our head as we move through this unit because the derivatives are just going to keep getting more and more complicated. So let's start using the chain rule with this one, y equals 3x squared plus 1 squared. So what we're going to first do is we're going to rewrite this as a composition of functions. And for most of the ones we do today, I'm going to write it as y equals some function in terms of u. So u squared, where u is equal to 3x squared plus 1. Right, so if I plug in 3x squared plus 1 is u, I get y equals 3x squared plus 1 squared. So this is the two functions that, when composed together, yield our original function. So we should be able to use the chain rule to find the derivative of this by first taking the derivative of y with respect to u. So dy du is 2u. This is dy du. And then we'll multiply that by the derivative of u with respect to x, which is 6x, du dx. And if we multiply those together, we get 12ux. And of course, we don't want an answer of 12ux. Since our original function was all in terms of x, we want our final result to all be in terms of x. So luckily, we know that u is equal to 3x squared plus 1. So we'll just rewrite this as 12x times 3x squared plus 1. And that's our final answer. We used dy dx is dy du times du dx. We were able to break it into the composition of functions and get a final result. Now, what we're going to do off to the side over here is let's expand this out just to see that if it's expanded, we'll get the same answer. So if I expand out 3x squared plus 1 using a bit of algebra here, we should get 9x to the 4th plus 6x squared plus 1. And then if I take the derivative with respect to x of 9x to the 4th plus 6x squared plus 1, we will get 36x cubed with power rule plus 12x. And then the plus 1 is as a constant, so it becomes 0. And if we were to go ahead and factor a 12x out of this, we'd see that we'd be left with 12x times 3x squared plus 1. So worked out perfect. Let's take a look at f of x equals the sine of 2x. So we'll use the chain rule first. We're going to say that this is y equals sine of u. Because the function 2x is within the function sine. So we're looking for the innermost function, and we're going to call that u. So y is sine of u, where u is 2x. dy du is cosine u. And du dx is just 2. So our derivative, dy dx, should equal 2 cosine u. 
right? dy dx is equal to dy du times du dx according to the chain rule. And since u is 2x, this is just 2 cosine 2x. And that's our derivative of sine 2x. Now, we should know from our previous math classes that the sine of 2x is also equal to 2 sine x cosine x using the double angle idea. And so 2 sine x cosine x could be evaluated using the product rule if we want to find the derivative. So f prime of x should also equal 2, that constant out in front, times the derivative of sine times cosine. Well, the derivative of sine times cosine is first function sine times the derivative of cosine, negative sine, plus second function, cosine, times the derivative of first function, derivative of sine is cosine. And so we end up with 2 times cosine squared x minus sine squared x. And hopefully we remember that that is the double angle formula or cosine, and this is the same as 2 cosine 2x. And again, either way you want to go about this problem is fine. I think it's a lot easier to use the chain rule. Um, and most of the problems we're going to use the rest of the day, we're going to have to use the chain rule. There won't be a nice little method to rewrite it into a product rule or a power rule form. So let's take a look at sine of x squared plus x. If we want to differentiate this, we could write this as y is equal to the sine of u, where u is equal to x squared plus x. And then we should be able to go in and take the derivative of y with respect to u, that'd be cosine u, and multiply it by the derivative of u with respect to x using the power rule. So dy dx is cosine u times 2x plus 1. Or, and I'm going to put the 2x plus 1 in the front just so it doesn't look like it's inside the cosine here. 2x plus 1 times the cosine of x squared plus x. And there's our derivative. And if we think about it as in the... Uh, in the way that I was talking about f of g of x, right? Um, g of x would be x squared plus x. We could write it this way. f of x is sine x, and g of x is x squared plus x. And so the composition f of g of x is sine of x squared plus x. And it's the derivative of the outer function, sine, evaluated at the inner function, x squared plus x, times the derivative of the inner function, 2x plus 1. Okay. So the derivative of the outer function, the inner function, times the derivative of the inner function. Here we've got f of x equals the square root of x squared plus 1. And we're looking for f prime of x again. So let's rewrite this as y equals root u, where u is equal to x squared plus 1. dy du should be 1 over 2 root u. So we're going to say dy dx is equal to 1 over 2 root u times the derivative of u with respect to x, which is just 2x. So here we've got now x in the numerator. The 2s should cancel. And in the denominator, we have a square root of u, which is the square root of x squared plus 1. That's about all there is to the chain rule. And so we start doing the chain rule within the chain. There's a couple different ways to go about this one. The easiest is probably to think about this as y equals u to the power of negative 3, where u is equal to 4x squared plus 6x minus 7. 
And we know that the derivative of y with respect to u is just a power rule problem. So dy dx, which is dy du times du dx, should be negative 3u to the negative 4 times du dx, which is 8x plus 6. So we'll leave that negative 3 and that 8x plus 6 up in the numerator. If you want to factor the 2 out of that, you can, but it's not really that important. Negative 3 times 8x plus 6 in the numerator with u to the fourth, or 4x squared plus 6x minus 7 to the fourth in the denominator. Here we've got a cube root of u. y equals u to the one third, the cube root of u, where u is equal to 5x squared minus x plus 4. And again, f prime of x or dy dx ought to equal one third u to the negative two thirds, dy du, using the power rule, times du dx. 10x minus 1, again using the power rule. And so now we just end up with that 10x minus 1 in the numerator, the 3 is in the denominator, and we have our u, 5x squared minus x plus 4 to the 2 thirds power in the denominator with it. Here's where the derivatives start to get just a little bit more complicated. So now we have 2x plus 5 to the third power times 3x minus 1 to the fourth power, which means we've got a product of two functions, but both of those functions are being raised to a power. So what we're looking at here is a problem that on the outside requires b product rule. We're going to say this function is u and this function is v, right? And we'll have to use the product rule for that. But in order to find the derivative of each piece of the product rule, we'll have to use the chain rule. Or we could distribute them out fully, but that's going to be way more effort than we really want to do. So what we'll do is f prime of x is equal to u 2x plus 5 to the third. And then let's go off to another page here for a second and find the derivative of 3x minus 1 to the fourth. 3x minus 1 to the fourth, if I do this sort of off the side separately, let's let this be y equals u to the fourth, where u is 3x minus 1. That would give us 4u cubed times 3 using the chain rule, or 12 u cubed. So we've got 12 times 3x minus 1 cubed as our derivative of 3x minus 1 to the fourth power. And okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, so we'll go in and we'll put that in there. So now we've got a 12 and we've got a 3x minus 1 to the third. And then we'll add to that our second function, 3x minus 1 to the fourth. And we're going to have to multiply that by the derivative of 2x plus 5 cubed. So we'll go back to this other page and define the derivative of 2x plus 5 cubed. We'll let y equal u cubed where u is 2x plus 5. So we get 3u squared times 2 using the chain rule, or 6 times 2x plus 5 to the second power. So we'll go ahead and put that in here. So we've now got a 6, and we've got a 2x plus 5 to the second power. 
And so this is our derivative. Now, obviously, this isn't in its most simplified form. This would be a perfectly acceptable answer. But there are a lot of reasons why, um, as we move forward into some applications of the derivatives, why we might need to simplify this down and do some factoring on it. So I think it'd be a good plan for us to practice that right now. So if I look at this as one piece and this as another piece of this function, let's think about what constant they have in common. Well, this one has a 12 and this one has a 6. So we'll factor out a 6. And if we think about powers of 2x plus 5, the smallest power that they have in common is 2x plus 5 to the second power. And if we think about 3x minus 1 powers, they have a 3x minus 1 to the third power in common. So what's left from the first term? If I've taken out a 6, well, the constant that's left is a 2. And if I've taken out 2x plus 5 squared from 2x plus 5 cubed, I'm just left with 2x plus 5. And if I take 3x minus 1 cubed out of 3x minus 1 cubed, there's nothing to put in over here. And then we'll add. If we've taken 6 out, we don't need to put anything in for a constant. We've taken out 2x plus 5 squared, so we don't need to take anything out for that. And we've taken out 3x minus 1 cubed from our 3x minus 1 to the 4, so we do need to put in a 3x minus 1. And now if we simplify this down into its fully factored form, we got 6 times 2x plus 5 squared times 3x minus 1 cubed times, if we distribute that, 2 times 2x is 4x. And if we add that to the 3x over here, that'll give us 7x. And 2 times the 5 is 10. And if we subtract the 1 over here from that, that ought to give us a plus Nine. And this is our fully factored derivative of 2x plus 5 cubed times 3x minus 1 to the 4. And this is going to be really important because in the next unit, we're going to have to set our derivatives equal to 0 um, and solve. And it's a lot easier to set this equal to 0 down here and solve than it is this first form that we got. So get in the habit and the practice of fully factoring out your own. Here we've got f of x is equal to the square root of 2x minus 5 times 3x plus 1 to the power of 6. So again, this is a product rule problem. But within the product rule, um, we're going to have to use the chain rule to find the derivative of root 2x minus 5 and 3x plus 1 to the 6. So an initial first setup should look like f prime of x is equal to the first function, root 2x minus 5, times the derivative of the second function. And to find the derivative of 3x plus 1 to the 6, let's find ourselves a new page real quick. If we're looking for the derivative of 3x plus 1 to the 6, that's y equals u to the 6, with u equal to 3x plus 1. So that should be 6u to the 5th times 3, or 18 times u to the 5th, or 3x plus 1 to the 5th. So we've got 18 times 3x plus 1 to the 5th. Let's throw that in right here, 18 and 3x plus 1 to the power of 5. And then we will add to that our second function, which was 3x plus 1 to the 6, times the derivative of root 2x minus 5. Well, if we've got root 2x minus 5, that's y equals root u, with u equal to 2x minus 5. And we should know that y equals root u differentiates to 1 over 2 root u, and 2x minus 5 differentiates to just 2. 
So what we end up with is one over root u or one over the square root of two x minus five. And so we'll just go ahead and pop that in over here. And I don't actually need to write it next to it. I'll just say over the square root of two x minus five, since it was one over that that we're multiplying. And now we're going to go through that same process that we did a minute ago and try and simplify this down into one multiplication and division of a bunch of nice little binomial terms. Here. So the first thing we'll have to do is we'll have to get a common denominator, which means that we're going to have to multiply this whole first piece by root 2x minus 5 over root 2x minus 5. So in order to do that, I'm just going to put the root 2x minus 5 into the denominator here. And if I'm multiplying the root 2x minus 5 to the top also, effectively that's just the same as squaring that one piece of it to give it a 2x minus 5. So what we're now looking at here is 2x minus 5 times 18 times 3x plus 1 to the fifth plus 3x plus 1 to the 6th, all over the square root of 2x minus 5. And if we go ahead and factor out the common term here in the numerator, the common term is just going to be this 3x plus 1 to the 5th, because that's all this piece and this piece had in common. So we'll end up with 3x plus 1 to the 5th, times what's left from this, which is 18 times 2x minus 5. And then we'll add to that what's left from this one, 3x plus 1 to the 6th, which if we've taken 3x plus 1 to the 5th is just 3x plus 1. And in the denominator, we'll still have the square root of 2x minus 5. And as we simplify this out in the numerator, we're going to be still left, I'm sorry, in the denominator, we'll still be left with root 2x minus 5. In the numerator, we'll still have that 3x plus 1 to the fifth power. But as we distribute this out, 18 times 2x is 36x, and we'll add the 3x to it to make that 39x. And the 18 times the negative 5 ought to be negative 90. And if we have negative 90 and add this 1 to it, that'll be negative 89. And that is our fully simplified derivative of f of x, which is the square root of 2x minus 5 times 3x plus 1 to the sixth power. We'll do just a couple more here. We're going to Take a look here at tangent cube of 4x, where we're going to have to actually apply the chain rule two times for this one. So if f of x is tangent cubed 4x, we have to look at what is the outermost function here. The outermost function that's going on is we are cubing the tangent of 4x. So this is y equals u cubed where u is equal to the tangent of 4x. So let's find our derivative here. Let's find dy dx. dy dx ought to be dy du, 3u squared, times du dx. Well, the problem with finding du dx is that we have tangent of 4x, tangent of a function. So we can't just say that's secant squared 4x. We have to break this down and say this is u equals tangent of some other variable. Normally, we'll use v, where v is equal to 4x. And we'll have to then apply the chain rule with u equals tangent 4x by finding the derivative of both of these and multiplying them down here by our dy du. So let's go ahead and do that. We've got our dy du. Our du dv 
times our dv dx should give us du dx, which is what needs to go here. So du dx is du dv, or secant squared b, times the derivative of b. So this is secant squared b, where we take the derivative. And this is just a form. The derivative of b with respect to x is just 4. So now it looks like we've got 4 times 3, constant of 12. We've got u squared, which is tangent of 4x squared, or tangent squared 4x. And then we've got secant squared v, or secant squared of v, 4x. And that is the chain rule within the chain rule, right? We've applied the chain rule once, and then a second time again. The chain rule within the chain. So you can you know, have as many composite functions as you need to, and you just break out the chain rule in each. So let's see if we can find the slope of the line that is uh, tangent to sine to the fifth of 2x at x equals pi over 3. So in order to find a tangent line slope, we just need to find the derivative and evaluate it at this x value, at x equals pi over 3. So to find the derivative, to find dy dx, we need to rewrite this as y equals the outermost function, right? u to the, say, we are raising sine 2x to the fifth power. So we have y equals u to the fifth, where u is sine so our derivative should be by u to the fourth times the derivative of sine 2x. Well, in order to find the derivative of sine 2x, we're going to have to rewrite this as u equals sine of b, where b is 2x, because this is the sine of a function, sine of 2x. So the derivative of u with respect to b is going to become cosine of b. And then we'll multiply by the derivative of 2x, which is just 2. So it looks like what we end up with here is going to be 10 sine to the fourth of 2x, because u is sine of 2x. So sine to the fourth of 2x times the cosine of b, or the cosine of 2x. And we wanted to evaluate this at x equals pi over 3. So dy dx at pi over 3 is just 10 sine to the fourth of 2 pi over 3 times the cosine of 2 pi over 3, which is 10 times, well, the sine of 2 pi over 3 as a reference saying reference angle for 2 pi over 3 is pi over 3. And we're in the second quadrant there. So the sine of pi over 3, we know is root 3 over 2. So we have root 3 over 2 to the fourth power. And then the cosine of 2 pi over 3, again, that's in the second quadrant, where cosine is negative, so negative. And then the reference angle is pi over 3, so we know that the cosine of pi over 3 is a half, so this should be negative 1 half. And if we go about simplifying that down, root 3 to the fourth power is root 3 times root 3 times root 3 times root 3, or 3 times 3, or 9. And so we're going to have a 9 times a 10, 90. We'll have a negative out in front. And we have 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times another 2 from over here. And we have 2 to the fifth. And 2 to the fifth is 32. We can reduce that by dividing them both by 2. Could have simplified that down first if we wanted to. Um, it should give us negative 45 over 16. And that is our final answer. 
So the last problem we're going to do today using the chain rule is we're going to show that the slope of 1 over 1 minus 2x, the third power is always positive. So a slope of a curve is just the derivative of it. So let's see if we can find the derivative here. So this is y equals u to the negative 3 power, where u is equal to 1 minus 2x. So to find the derivative, dy dx, we should just do dy dx equals negative 3 u to the negative 4 times the derivative of 1 minus 2x, which is just negative 2. So our derivative ends up being negative 3 times negative 2 is just 6. And u to the negative 4 drops to the denominator to become 1 minus 2x to the power of and we know that 6 in the numerator is always positive. And we know that any number I raise to the fourth power is going to be positive unless that number that I'm raising to the fourth power is 0. And the fourth power is always positive, 0. So the only thing that would make this greater than 0, or not greater than 0, would make it undefined, is if 1 minus 2x doesn't equal Right? And if 1 minus 2x doesn't equal 0, that means that 2x can't be 1 or x can't be 1. Okay? But luckily, x equals 1 half is not in the domain of our function. Right? Because if I try to put 1 half in right here, I get 1 minus 1, which is 0 to the third half. Right? This function here has an asymptote x equals 1 half. So the function has no slope there because it's not fine. So we've proven that regardless of the x value, as long as x isn't a half, which isn't in the domain for this function, the derivative is always greater than 0. And therefore, the slope of that curve is always positive. And that's where we're going to leave off today um, with the end of the chain rule. Next time, we're going to talk about derivatives of exponential functions. And then we're going to, that'll help us expand out and be able to take derivatives of a whole lot more different functions that we're going to come across. So that's it for today.